Uh, good afternoon. I'm Donna Hitchrich, a uh, member of the faculty at Columbia Business School. And I'm very grateful to be here again for the second year. And uh, thankful to Robert Smith and Vista for being uh, the anchor sponsor of this event. It was fabulous last year, and I've heard it's great this year. So I hope everybody had a great lunch. And uh, I do not, our panel does not stand between you and more food. So uh, we will try to keep it to just 30 minutes. But if we run over just a little we'll try bit, to keep them awake after it'll, be, it'll be OK. Yes, it'll be OK. Uh, after this, you'll go to your breakout sessions, and after that will be the woman's reception. So what we'll do is we'll have a little chat for about 20 minutes, and then Heidi, my good friend Heidi here from External Relations, will cue me when we're sort of our, done with our 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions, okay? I'm very, very happy uh, today to be uh, asked to moderate a discussion with Kristen Peck. Kristen's a 1999 graduate from Columbia Business School. I graduated in 90, so part of our conversation can kind of go about what's changed in the business school in that 10-year period of time. And I just wanted to, before I ask Kristen to introduce herself, she's an executive vice, vice president at Zoetis, is to just see by a show of hands, how many people are Columbia alums? Just give me hands. Oh, great. Ooh, awesome. How many people are current students, current Columbia students? And I heard we have some new admits. Any new admits? Yay. Excellent. Yay. Yay. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the fam. And uh, now the most important question, how many people have animals? All right, great, great. So we got a great, we got a great, we got, Columbia, we haven't gotten to the stage where you can bring your pets to work, but at Zoetis, uh, they can. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to just talk a little bit about her background, because I find when people actually say it, it spurs some things in your mind, and we want this to be interactive for the conversation. So it gives me great pleasure to join me in welcoming Kristen Pat. Thank you. Um, it is great to be here. Um, so uh, currently, I am executive vice president and group president of Zoetis. Um, I lead our US business, which is uh, about, give or take, $3 billion in revenue. Um, I also lead our BD, M&A, and strategy groups. Um, Zoetis, first of all, show of hands, how many people have heard of Zoetis? Yay! This is actually not bad. That's probably only 20%, but that's actually good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we are probably one of the largest companies you have not heard of. Uh, we are an S&P 500 company. Uh, our market cap's around 50 billion. Uh, and we are the world's largest animal health company. So that means uh, we make everything from medicines, vaccines, diagnostics, devices, precision livestock, farming, you name it, for pretty much eight species of animals. We used to joke we make something for every species but humans. But actually, we make human products now as well. It's not a focus, but we do. Um, I have, we've been an independent company. We spun off from Pfizer um, in an IPO uh, back in 2013. So we've been independent almost you know, six plus years now. Uh, before that, we were part of Pfizer. Um, in that role, I was on the executive team of Pfizer, uh, leading our business development um, VC uh, and BD group. And before that, strategy and innovation as well. Uh, I jokingly say I was destined to be in this job because my first job in high school, I worked in uh, equine. Uh, my family raised mm. horses. My dad produced rodeos. So maybe that was destiny. But my career, um, I went to Georgetown undergrad and majored in history and Spanish. I thought I'd work in foreign service. Um, I spent a semester studying and volunteering in Ecuador and realized the best way to impact the world was to create jobs because jobs is what would change things. And that's what really led me into mm -hmm. business. Um, I actually spent my career first in uh, real estate um, for Prudential, uh, worked then in private equity for a number of years with the O'Connor Group, uh, and then spent uh, a wonderful two years at Columbia Business School, which I loved. I am one of the proudest uh, graduates, uh, Cluster A, in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, exactly. Um, and uh, after that, I worked in consulting for the Boston Consulting Group for mm -hmm. six years, doing mostly M&A and BD. And, Pfizer did a lot of M&A and BD, and that's really how I ended up at Pfizer. Um, so I guess you'd call that like a little bit of an obstacle course, not exactly a path. Um, but I've worked in everything, obviously, from finance uh, to private equity to HR, um, believe it or not, uh, to operations to strategy. And I think that sort of robust uh, sort of background in lots of different things has probably prepared me best for uh, what I'm doing today. And that's pretty amazing, because I mean, I, I spent my whole career in M&A, first as a lawyer. <laughs> And then as a and as a banker, so I, you know, it was kind of a sort of a straight shot for me. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, and I mentioned the M and A because that's what I teach, and the data shows that uh, when companies spin something off, right, when they do an equity carve out, uh, that's likely that the company that spun actually gets acquired within mm -hmm. the three to five years time frame. So, 
you know, a lot of people shy away from change, especially M&A. They're concerned about who's going to be the new buyer, what's, who's going to be my new boss. You stepped up to be part of the Spun Company. Can you talk a little bit about that and what sort of encouraged you to sort of do that? I was excited. As opposed excited. to staying at the um, mothership? Yes. Um, and some, many people thought I was... Uh, Nuts? Sli- yes. Um, you're on the executive <laughs> team of this huge company. Why would you do that? Part of it is a personality. I, I love change. Um, um, I love disruption. It, it excites me. So I think that was part of it. But I also really cared about the mission of what we were doing. Um, animal health really meant something to me. So I, I did embrace it. Uh, that The statistic you said was right. was right. And I think most people probably did expect that um, of our business. But I think, you know, we have our performances, you know, people were pretty skeptical um, when we IPO'd probably for a while. But um, we IPO'd, for those who don't know, at 26. And we're currently trading somewhere between 95 to 100. So uh, six years later. So it's been a nice ride. Wow. And so how did you, maybe you could help us think a little bit about that thought process. I mean, I, it's, it's fine to say that you embrace change, and I think that's great, but, you know, you, you, you had a career, right? You had been at Pfizer, you had been established. It wasn't like you were like, oh, I'll take a lottery ticket, right? You, you were leaving something. Yes. Uh, how did you kind of, and you, you, you had, you know, life, you had, I don't know if you had your kids at that point, but how do you sort of think through all of that and really step into the, into the change and feel comfortable about it? Sure. Um, I am married. I do have two children. Uh, they are both 13. My daughter's adopted, so she's five months older than my son. Um, but, uh, you know, the honest answer is just I wanted to have impact. Um, what drives me most mm-hmm. is feeling I can really change something and, you know, impact others, people um, in a positive way. And I looked at the opportunity to be part of something new where you could actually establish it yourself. There really was no large public animal health company. Um, and I thought we could really do something together as a team and make a difference. And so, you know, Pfizer was established, you mm-hmm. know, and I could have a small amount of impact, but I really felt like with this new company, and we were small back then, I mean, we, we certainly weren't S&P 500, right. and I felt like the amount of impact that I could have uh, on a business and on an organization and on our customers was just greater, and that's not only what excites me, I always say um, the most dangerous job to put me in is one where you just want me to do you know, what we did last mm-hmm. year. I, I, I don't do well in that environment. It, it's very frustrating to me. So I, I like to constantly, I use the word, I think I'm a frustrated optimist. Uh, I'm very optimistic about the world, but I think it can always be done better. Um, I try to hire frustrated optimists. Mm-hmm. So I think I looked at this and thought, this is a great business, but imagine what we could do with it. And that excitement is what drove me to it. And I also would say I have a phenomenal husband. He is also, by the way, a Columbia grad, as many of you know, uh, class of 97. Um, and whenever, uh, we had a challenge and there was a question like, should I take this job? Um, you know, do you think I can really succeed? He would take an if, and he'd ask me a how. So his question is, don't ask if you can do something, ask how you could do it. And that took a lot of partnership from my husband to let, you know, it was going to be a lot Mm -hmm. of time and especially on a roadshow for an IPO for months. Um, but my husband has helped me make, live my dreams as I've supported my husband living his. So, you know, as an M&A person, I did uh, due diligence, because that's what we do. So I figured, all right. I did due diligence with my husband, too. Okay. <laughs> he jokingly said he met me um, at a Black Friday party, as only a CBS grad could go to. Um, and he thought I was cute. And before I met with him, he worked at Merrill. I knew his job, his boss, how he was doing in his reviews, and everyone he did it for the last four years. Well, there you go. So <clears throat> in my due diligence, I had read all these stories about you know diversity and, and in, in full disclosure, my husband Tom worked for Pfizer for many, many years. So when I got a chance to do this, I said to Tom, I said, hey, I'm gonna interview somebody from, and he worked in animal health, but he had retired before the, before the spin. So, um, so I said, I read all these diversity articles and how you're one of the best 100 companies and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and so then I get on the website and lo and behold, I look at the composition of the executive team. Now there are, there's a CEO who's a male, but they have eight people on the executive team. By a show of hands, uh, how many people think their executive team has more than 20% women? Okay, 50%. So the Pfizer team, they walk, <clears throat> they walk the walk and talk the talk at Zoetis. So talk a little bit about that, because also in my due diligence, I found that you were one of the people that are cited as being responsible for that. So it's not like you just like walked into a team where they put you know, four out of the eight people being women they actually cite you as one of the leader, thought leaders in making that happen. So maybe you can help us think a little bit about um, how you as a leader make that happen and how when we're looking for jobs, we want to look at a company that does more than just sort of say yada, yada, yada. They actually, the proof's in the pudding. 
I mean, I would say a few things. For starters, uh, our CEO has a team that's incredibly diverse. It is half women, but we also have an African American. It's diverse in, in every way. And I think the tone from the top in an organization really matters. Um, my team is half women. My mm -hmm. leadership team in the US is also half women. Um, I think that you know, the more women can you know, support other women, the more men can support bringing diversity into a team. I think that lots of people from diverse backgrounds look up in an organization um, and they want to see role models that look and feel like them. And it doesn't always mean a woman wants to see a woman, but she might want to see, for me, I wanted to see uh, successful people who were both parents worked mm -hmm. because that was the vision that I had. So I don't think it's just about being a woman, but I do think it also means feeling you can have a voice mm -hmm. um, and a different voice in a conversation. And I felt that I could have that at the leadership team level. And I ensured in my leadership team today that everyone's voice matters, whether or not that's your day job. So I feel like the marketing person should be able to speak about sales and finance, chip in. That you, if you want diverse perspectives, you need to encourage them. And I do think it really matters that you bring people from different backgrounds. Um, so I think of diversity broader than just gender or race, but also you know, new colleagues. I think you need a, people who've been in the company a long time, some fresh perspectives, people who came from different backgrounds. So I'm very fortunate that it, the tone did start at the top in my company. Um, and it's always been there, actually, since we IPO'd. That's one of the reasons we win many of the awards. But it exists. You know, if you look at my leadership team, it is the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's not just internal company propaganda. You've been selected by Forbes and other companies as one of the best places to work for. So let's talk a little bit about um, technology. When I teach at Columbia now, uh, one of the guys that I have the hardest time getting out of my classroom, because those of you that go there, you know, only, we only have 15 minutes before classes. And there's one guy that teaches coding. Now, who would think that the coding class would be that engaging? The class is full, <laughs> and the guy never leaves the podium. I've got to be like, come on, man, I got to, you know, I got to teach. And uh, so, can you talk a little bit about technology beyond like an app on your phone or being a famous coder or something like that? Because technology now is pervading every business, right? I, I talk to the consulting firms, and they're using AI in ways that you wouldn't think about it. Private equity is using it, right, as part of the due diligence process when they're doing due diligence on a company. How are they going to make it be able to perform better? Because uh, I'll just speak quickly about private equity. You know, you can't just cut costs. To achieve the growth that you need to achieve in these businesses and to keep your stock price up, um, it cannot be a cost-cutting story. It has to be a top-line growth story, which is incredibly hard to achieve. So maybe you could talk a little bit about technology in, in your business and how you can think about that. I mean, I, I always say, you know, my husband, by the way, in full disclosure, is a tech banker. Um, and I jokingly say with him, you know, you're in this little world, but he gets pulled in all the time to uh, go to a bid for, you know, one of the largest, uh, you know, retailers. Because mm -hmm. everybody today, if they want to be successful, has to just be at the very least tech enabled. But Zoetis isn't just tech enabled. In other words, we don't just do analytics on our customers and what they buy to better target. And that's, by the way, critical to driving our top line growth. But technology is actually a product that we sell. So we're in what's called precision livestock farming. Um, which you may have read about. There's been a number of articles recently um, in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. But basically, it's technology that you would put on an animal, so on a cow, a dairy cow, and it can better predict uh, whether that cow is healthy, whether that cow is in heat. And that helps you make much better decisions um, on how to treat that animal. Make sure that you can catch an illness quickly before it infects others, or you can breed that animal as quickly as you can, which makes it more productive um, and is better for the environment. So. There's a lot of benefits. Um, what that is is both the technology of a tag, but really it's the analytics and artificial intelligence behind that that looks at the daily habits not just of a herd, but of an individual animal. So what's the normal behavior of this animal, and how is it different today? And what would that lead you to believe? Now, you can imply things by understanding a herd, um, but you know I'm also on the board of Thomson Reuters. Uh, and as you think about legal profession, AI is critical to that. You know, you can now pretty much have uh, technology tell you, you know, what cases you should cite. Um, if you're going in front of a judge, what are the last few cases that are similar to this? Um, what was cited and when that side won, which right. are the cases that he chose? So believe it or not, technology, no matter what real profession you're talking about, is becoming core not just as an enabler, but as a revenue source um, for the company. And so I would say historically, if you look at Thomson Reuters, it was we sold content. We're now actually selling technology. That's what we sell. And you know the same thing at Zoetis. We're more and more of our products, diagnostics. We're in genetics, which is really just tech. It's analyzing you know, DNA and 
predicting what animal um, is less likely to get disease. So you can breed an animal that's already less likely to get ill and need products. So, but can you, that's interesting. And can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the speed at which this has happened, right? Because I think of myself graduating from Columbia Business School in 1990, and you know, we were like, you know, when I worked at First Boston and we showed a client comparable companies and we showed them the acquisitions that had taken place in their space, that was like, wow. Now that's like, are you kidding me? They press the button on their desk and they have that information too, right? <laughs> so, you know, you have increased competition in the investment banking industry and we're no longer the keepers of the info. Our clients have the info. So that really puts a lot of pressure on the banking side to come up with innovative, creative ideas. So I guess technology is helpful, but it also kind of Help us think about that. How how you make technology helpful, not be prisoner of it. What kind of where's still the human element of the creativity in that in your business and what you guys do? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you look at artificial intelligence, it's really it really requires people to ask the right questions right, at the okay. end of the day. So, but what I'd say is really changes the pace of change is so fast, mm -hmm. and the competition for talent in the tech space is just incredible, um, and nobody can get enough people. Um, who are experienced data scientists or software developers, you name it. it. It is just the war for talent in the space. I mean, if you're here, I am insanely optimistic about the future for women in tech. The reality is there are not enough people in technology. There's not enough people passionate about it. And for us, the pace of change for us just, you know, it's not enough. You, we used to put a diagnostic piece of equipment out, and it was fine for five to ten years. Well, mm -hmm. not anymore because they want the data on that, you know, that, that unit, you know, puts out every day integrated. They want to then analyze that information and combine it with a different data pool. So you need, you know, data scientists to connect, you know, in the cloud, disparate data pool. I mean, like, it's just, and there's constantly new data that we want to integrate. Um, so it is, it is hard to keep up. Um, and it's a wonderful opportunity for anybody. But, you know, this is a great opportunity for women. They need talented people, and it doesn't matter the company. Um, and I think the great news is, it, you know, I, there's a lot spoken about, in my view, about how difficult it is for women in tech. And I, uh -huh. I think that's true. But tech isn't just those few cool technology right. companies in Silicon Valley. There's phenomenal opportunities at companies like Zoetis or Thomson Reuters in cultures that are incredibly right. supportive, in my view, of women. Right, right. So if you were sitting back now in the audience, what would you tell your 20-something-year-old self? If you were thinking about either you're in your job now and you're not sure you want to be there, you just, what would you think of now? Um, what would you tell your 20-year-old self today in 2019? Well, I always start with what are you passionate about? Okay. I think we're always best in the things that we really love. Um, look, So the, even though you've moved around, what would you say your passion was that ties this whole thing together? Sure. So um, I'm passionate about impacting people. Okay. So if you ask me, like, what do I think, you know, what really drives me? I think um, I am a passionate and curious person who loves uh, to drive change and impact through people. And so what I always looked like was, what's a cool, gnarly problem mm -hmm. um, that with a team of people I want to work with? And actually, that's the common thread through mm -hmm. everything that I've done is it was, wow, I could really make a difference. Right. This is something that, that needs help. Um, and these are people that I'll learn from. Um, and you know, I feel like we can have, make a difference. And I think that's what I would say to my children. I think the reality is, so much of the future world will be in technology. So my kids all take coding classes. So they would be in, I hate to say it, you're the professor. Um, I mean, well, not because I think they're both going to be coders. Um, you know, both of them actually tend mm -hmm. to like that. They're both sort of scientific children. But um, I think investing in STEM is, is just huge. Whether or not that's what you want to be, it's going, you need to have an understanding of that, right. no matter what you go into. So, you know, I am raising, they're not quite 20, but at 13, I'm encouraging them to just understand it. Whether that's what they choose to do, they need to, have a sense of that no matter what they choose. Okay, good. Uh, we're gonna get, get a couple questions. We have time for questions, right? So we're gonna have some questions. We have somebody going around with a mic? Okay. If you wouldn't mind just identifying yourself and uh, you know what your affiliation is, we'll, we'll start here. Whoops, or there? No, or there. Or there. <laughs> oh, or here. There we go. Georgia's got the mic. There we go. Hi. Can you just stand up so everybody can okay. hear you? Thanks. Uh, Lisa Portney. Uh, CBS 2021. 2021, all right. So um, I work with Mike Ehlers. You might know him. Uh, I'm wondering how you reconcile, and I don't want this to come off in a way that sounds offensive because I really don't mean it um, to sound that way, how you reconcile going, uh, you said that it's really meaningful, meaningful for you to create jobs and how you can go from a job that is saving lives 
to a job that's creating jobs and how you and how you find a way to find meaning in your work mm -hmm. that makes you feel good. Sure, when you say saving lives, do you mean? Well, so uh, your work at Pfizer. Oh, sure. The mothership. Sure. Um, you know, I save animal lives today. Um, yeah. That is what we do. Um, there's a lot of research around the human-animal bond. First of all, there's lots of ways to impact people and to help them. Um, yeah. I, I feel just as passionately at Pfizer as I, I do where I am now. I, I deal with many of the same diseases, just in a slightly different species or actually more species. Um, but I also think the two things, the healing power of pets. Um, there's millions of studies. Uh, we invested in something called HABRI, the Human Animal Bond Research Institute. Um, and the fact is we support canine courage, which is mm -hmm. you know, having animals support vets, having animals support, I mean, there's a huge role they play in helping with PTSD. Um, and the reality is I have a 97-year-old grandmother, and I will tell you, who lives on her own. And she's here because she has a dog, because that dog right. gets her up every Purpose, day, and she yeah. walks that dog. I think animals have a huge impact, but they also have a huge impact on humans. So we're also in the livestock space, and yeah. making sure you have a safe and affordable food supply makes a big difference to the world. So I just think you have to figure out where your greatest passion is and where you feel you individually can have impact. Um, I feel like... For me, I need something that I feel like can have more immediate impact. Human health is amazing. It takes a very much longer to bring a drug to market in human health than animal health, primarily because we can work in our species immediately. Humans work in other species before they get there. Um, and we just have more flexibility. We can invest in innovation much faster than they can in human health. So you know, I think they were both great jobs, but I feel just as passionate, and I feel like I have just as much impact, just in maybe different ways. And then we have over here. Yep. We want to just stand up and <clears throat> George will bring that mic. Hi, my name is Achenyo. I'm a current MBA student, a second year, about to graduate. And I'm, I really resonate, what you said about having different roles really resonated with me because I think in today's world, most people do a job for about two years and they leave and they keep transitioning, you know. Um, so I've done so many different roles in my career and I'm just trying to find a story to weave together. And I'm wondering, how did you do that over your career? How did you tie doing HR with ops in PE and then consulting to this amazing place that you are now? And how did you, how do you think about it? How do you think we should articulate that going forward? Sure. Um, believe it or not, I haven't actually worked for very many companies. I think on my resume, there's really yeah. only like four over the last 27 years. Um, what it is, is I think you should consider your career um, not as every year you move up or every few years you move up. It sometimes requires moving to the side to build skills. So I think in order to be a really good general manager, you need to have an understanding of lots of different things. So one of the hardest jobs I've ever had, actually, when I came to Zoetis, I had manufacturing reporting to me. It was an amazing yeah. education, by the way. I highly recommend, again, you're going to think that's a crazy piece of advice, but truly appreciating what it takes to make a yeah. product it is an incredible education. So I think as you think about your careers, think about where you want to go and what skills and capabilities that you need. I did most of those changes within the same companies. Um, and to me, it was, again, wow, cool, gnarly problem. Like HR, by the way, no background in HR. Phenomenal education for me now yes. in leading people um, and doing talent development. A company is its talent. And having that two and a half years in HR when I joined Pfizer, and well, how did I get there? Well. We had just done a deal. They, were, they brought in a new head of HR, and they wanted a brand new strategy. And they said, will you do this for two years? And I was like, she was amazing. Um, Yvonne Jackson, I think the world uh -huh. of her. Um, and she was willing to invest in me and develop me. And I said, great. And it was an amazing education that, you know, look, I think it helped me get on the board of Thomson Reuters. I sit on the HR and compensation committee. And that deep knowledge yeah. of incentive compensation and executive compensation and talent development. So I, I think it's hard to know always what each role is going to help you do. But I think building that network, building a diverse network, and not just saying I'm going to go like this, but I may go to the side here and there to build a skill or capability that ultimately is going to make me a stronger candidate is something I really encourage people that I develop in my own organization. I mean, we have a great example, a woman who, as many Columbia people know, Saba Belay, we just, who just hired actually one of the Columbia grads from last year, um, who works in my business analytics group. And she came to me and she said, um, she's from Ethiopia, and she said, I came here, I did analytics, that's what I always thought I wanted, but now I want to be a general manager. She's amazing, and many of the Columbia people know her, and I said, great, let's put you in marketing. 
like she's never done marketing in her life. My yeah. point is, but she, she has strong learning agility. She's curious. And my point is, you're never going to be general management if all you do are analytics. You need exposure to the customer. So let's, and by the way, that's literally, she said it. We met as a leadership team. We said, someone, let's find her a secondment. It doesn't even have to be a job. It could right. be a project. Right. But I really encourage you know, everybody to think about moving around, not companies always, because by the way, that's not always great, although sometimes that does help. But what are ways I'll get new capabilities that will help me? Yeah, and I think it's not even skills. It's also empathy, right? I think what you said, a really important point about just appreciating what manufacturing does, you know what I mean? Because yeah. as a banker, you know, my whole career, we just look at things on an org chart and just assume that, you know, it gets done, right? And we translate <laughs> it we translate it into a cell on a spreadsheet and hope we copied the right one, right? But you need to, you, d developing that empathy, and I, and I know you do some things outside of work. Maybe you could just speak to really quickly. You don't always need to be at a job to develop those skills and that empathy, right? I mean, you can be doing things in your community and other things that, that, that kind of give you that perspective. I mean, I mean, the one thing that, there's many, so many things I love about this job, but I get to see a lot of America right. Um, right. in this job. So um, I travel over the country. My customers are a lot in rural America. And mm -hmm. there is really a difference, to be yeah. very honest with you, with how people on the coasts think than the way the rest of the country. And an appreciation of that. And what is a life like um, for a farmer in right. you know, Oklahoma or in Kansas? And how do they think? Because if I'm going to delight my customers right. and I'm obsessed with customer experience, I need to know what my customer's life is like. The reality is most vets are small business owners and they do the books at night. And if I am not available, why does that matter? What does that teach me? Well, when we started, we were open from like, you know, seven or eight in the morning to like six or seven at night. Well, but they're doing their books mm -hmm. at night. They, they're going to call in a billing question. I need to be able to help them as a small business owner. And they need to be able to get immediate no, that was paid, that's open, you know, 24-7 online. Believe it or not, in our industry, that was not normal a mere three years ago. Yeah. Um, it wasn't necessary. But spending time with customers, realizing what their life is really like, who really does this and how do they think about it? makes you think differently about your job. Yeah, I, I've been to a dairy farm, which I never thought I'd be to. I mean, as a banker, you get to go to fun stuff. I've been to a calf cow operation. It really gives wow. you a different, you, you. a different perspective on, on stuff. It's important, important. Question out here? Any questions? Question, question? No? So uh, if you, we'll, we'll get another one percolating in a second. But uh, so what's next for you? We've got a fabulous career. You've got children that seem like they're, you know, well on their way to being launched. Well, kind of in the middle of being launched. I don't know. <laughs> kind of in the middle of being launched. Year old. We're and, still at the eye roll stage. Okay. But, yes. but uh, what's next for you? Um, I love what I'm doing. Um, I just can want to continue to look for new roles that you know, are challenging. I, you know, we have so much growth in Zoetis to go um, that you know, I kind of feel like there's way more that we're doing even in the data analytics space. You know, we, we spent hours on it this week as a leadership team. I think you're going to see fun, new, exciting things coming out of our company. I think so much of our future really is in better meeting a customer's needs and the level of unmet medical needs in our space um, are huge. I, I was actually meeting with a company here um, in the telemedicine. Um, mm, that's uh, tele yeah. I mean, like, yeah. it's just, it's exploding with opportunities. Um, and these are CBS grads starting this company. So to me, I, I, I'm so energized by the opportunities in front of me and in front of our company. Um, and I think it's going to have a huge impact, so it's exciting. Yeah. And what, what, what is your uh, fondest memory of CBS that you can share? <laughs> oh my God! That I can share. Um, well, I was. This is gonna. Uh, I was part of the GBA. The um, and we had so much fun running. Like you know, any GBA did, like, here? Any GBA any of the, uh, it was like government? the yeah, okay. student, student government. Yes, it was super fun. We we always had a really good time, and you know, planning our you know parties on Thursday nights and figuring out what we thought we were the future of the school. It was. It got me really involved in wanting to stay connected to the university, which is something I do today uh, very actively. I'm on the board of the Deming Center. Um, uh, with not, you know, it's just, you know, for my husband, and I, he's involved with the Entrepreneur Center a lot. There's, we, it really just made me very committed to continuing, you know, back then in my small role, but even today, just wanting to invest in the students and invest in the school. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to just follow up on that. Um, because I didn't realize, but back in, so I guess in the middle of the 90s, when I left, we had, we were deanless when I was here from 89 to 90, and then Mayor Felberg was the dean, who was yes. the dean with you. Mm -hmm. But he came as I was walking across the stage to get my diploma. So a lot of Columbia changed it, sort of in the mid-90s when they instituted the clusters and stuff like that. So can you talk a little bit about, though, how you do keep in contact with the alumni? Because we're always talking about that, and I'm sure some of you that aren't at Columbia are like, yeah, whatever. But it really does, it does make a big difference. And you find the connections among people. So maybe we could close out on that, just sort of this whole alumni network and how you've utilized sort of your relationships at Columbia on a going forward basis. 
Yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate in that I had a phenomenal set of friends from Columbia, um, and we're all still incredibly close. So I, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a core part of my friendship and my business network um, that was there. Um, it's it's about your initiative. I mean, right. I chose to stay involved. I was first in the healthcare program, um, and you know, it was really with you know uh, Clifford uh, and Clifford, yeah. yep. Um, and I did that for many years, and then exactly. believe it or not, you know. They reached out to me. Another alum, Beth Ford, believe it or not, there's a bunch of women in ag, I mean, believe it or not, um, who's a grad as well. Um, she said, you should really get involved in the DEM. Again, it, it's about a diverse network, and she pulled me in. And, you know, believe it or not, I had actually taken his classes, so I thought it was great. Um, it was such an op awesome opportunity a few years yeah. ago. So to me, it's, it's, you know, putting it out there, staying networked, a diverse network, and it, you know, different opportunities throughout the last, you know, oh, my God. By the way, this was my 20-year um, reunion this year. So it's just constantly keeping up with that network and they give you new opportunities and then choosing to invest and give back. I mean, I'll be speaking at the Sergio Marchioni um, uh, session later this month, actually, at Columbia, but it's important to me. I, I feel like I want to give back. I had such an amazing experience when I was there. And, um, you know, my class was the highest percentage of women ever when I was there. What percent was that? I want to say it was 37%. Yeah, because when I went there, it was only about 20%. Yeah, and percent. we were really proud of it. And it made a big difference. Again, maybe I've been fortunate. And therefore, we felt like we were a really big part of it. Um, Gene, I remember, yep. Gene and I worked together way back then. So, I mean, uh, I was really, what is it now? Uh, now, what's the stat? We're up to how much? 39, all right. 39%, yeah. You gotta get yes. So we're getting there. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're definitely getting there. So I want to thank you very much. Are you going to be with us for the rest of the day? You're going to be uh, for next, the, yeah, well, another hour. <laughs> another hour. So, so you'll obviously have a chance to, to chat and stuff, but I want to thank you very much. And uh, there's a lot of great stuff here today, and we'll go off to our breakout sessions. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.